Welcome back. Thank we you. are very, very pleased to have George Ritzer and Michael Ryan here with us for our second keynote address. I'm going to pass things off to Maury, who is on the road, but he's going to be hosting this session. Good afternoon, everybody. I, yes, I am on the road uh, here in Annecy in France, uh, as you can see behind me. And um, I just want to uh, say how happy I am that George and Michael are with us. This is, you, you could not have, um, a more potent and more relevant topic. And, and of course, uh, George Richter has been you know, writing, writing the book um, uh, on what it means in social, sociology in practice and what it means for the world for some 50 years. He's, of course, uh, a distinguished university professor emeritus at the University of Maryland uh, and has been working quite a bit in recent decades with Mike Ryan. Who, if I am not uh, mistaken, is actually on the faculty at uh, uh, Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. Um, and what they have been doing together, in particular recently, is looking at COVID and its effects on some of the, the work that uh, George started uh, many years ago on, on, on McDonaldization and how, how, how the global system evolves uh, as people's practice and business practice um, uh, seeps across boundaries and borders, etc. So, uh, without further ado, thank you both very much for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, and uh, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Am I up? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll start. Um, I'll try to do this in ten minutes and give Mike uh, twenty minutes to talk. Mike's the expert on COVID. So the, the immediate source of my interest in COVID was the explosion of the pandemic in 2019, just as I was working on the 10th edition of the Colonization Society. I, I just had to try to grapple with the seemingly uh, irrational event in an increasingly rationalized and McDonaldized world. Um, at the same time, I learned that Mike Ryan, a friend of long, long standing, was publishing a great deal on the pandemic. It made sense to collaborate on this, to combine his vast knowledge um, on, the, on COVID with my theoretical perspective. So on that perspective, uh, some background, um, there are sort of personal uh, origins of this and intellectual origins, origins, uh, our origins, not oranges. Um, at an intellectual level, the, the main source of my interest is the work of Max Weber, um, especially his concept of formal rationality, or more generally, uh, his uh, theory of the rationalization of the Western world. Uh, rationalization and McDonaldization is simply my uh, term for what Weber called rationalization. As, as you probably know, uh, for Weber, the central concept uh, in rationalization, the central a central for factor in, in rationalization was the bureaucracy. And uh, basically, when I looked around uh, at the world in the 70s and 80s, uh, it seemed to me that the fast food restaurant had become a um, better example of uh, what Weber was writing about. Um, so it's uh, been transformed to the McDonaldization of society. And the fast food restaurant has come to be, for me, the paradigm of this uh, process. Um, so Baber was interested in, in uh, the rationalization in the, in the Western world, what expedited its development there, and the barriers to it that exist elsewhere in the world. Um, so uh, conceptually for, for Baber, he was interested in uh, various types of rationality, <clears throat> pragmatic, practical rationality or pragmatic rationality is sort of the everyday rationality that we employ in dealing with the various uh, uh, problems that we encounter. Uh, theoretical cognitive rationality is obviously uh, an internal uh, mental process. Substantive ra rationality relates to values, and even though there are values involved, we uh, rationally find, seek ways to uh, adhere to those values. But the most important type of rationality for Weber was formal rationality. Uh, and this involves a choice of means to ends with reference to rules, laws, regulations. It's objective, it's institutionalized, it's supra-individual, it's embedded in social structure and external and cursive of the individual. 
So the bureaucracy has that characteristic. Um, capitalism has that characteristic and uh, fast food industry has that characteristic. Um, form rationality can be best understood in terms of its basic elements. <clears throat> they are efficiency, um, seeking the, um, the best means to whatever ends one has. Uh, often those are laid out for one in a fast food restaurant or in a bureaucracy. Uh, predictability that the, the products and work that goes on in uh, these settings is predictable from one time uh, and place to another time and place. There's great emphasis on informed rationale and calculability on what can be counted, what can, can be calculated, um, and, quant and quantity. Quant quantification of, th of things is most important in formal rationality. Um, and very often uh, quantity comes to be a substitute for quality. Uh, famously for a long time, McDonald's had a sign of how many billion hamburgers they sold. And that was uh, taken to be a sign of the... Um... The success of McDonald's. Um, and finally, a form of rationality involves control. Uh, control, control, especially over people. Control over the... Uh, people who work in these formula rationalized systems and the people who are served by those formalized, formula rationalized systems. Um, so that, that's a sort of intellectual quick overview of Weber on that. Mm -hmm. Personally, um, I grew up in, the, in New York in the, in the 1940s um, and it was a world of uh, small non mcdonaldized businesses. So this, the, the role of these, of these chains of businesses um, struck me. Uh, my first exposure to McDonald's was in the late 1950s on a trip, college trip uh, to Massachusetts, and it, and it had a lasting impact on me. And uh, I was both interested in it and, and offended by it. Um, I, I realized that the fast food industry was, was important, McDonald's was important, but in need of critical analysis, similar to Weber's critical analysis of bureaucracy. Um, so basically, we've, we've moved. Uh, in my argument from the bureaucracy as the paradigm of the formal rationality um, to the fast food restaurant as the, as the paradigm of uh, formal rationality today. This is also reflective of, of an important shift for me uh, in, the, in the society and in, in my own work um, from production to consumption. Uh, most thinking I think on formal rationality uh, had to do with uh, production the assembly line is an example of a formerly rational production system. And uh, I think it was important that that was uh, transformed into something that was adopted by in consumption settings. And since consumption um, has become more important, much more important than production in American society, um, that, that linkage is, is key. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of, of, of rationality is the irrationality that uh, often or always accompanies it. Um, so the, the ir irrationality of rationality is basic, basic to the critique of bureaucracies and to fast food restaurants. In fact, to, to all forms of formal rationality. Um, so if you fast forward to 2019, and I was working on the 10th edition of the McDonaldization Society, um, formal rationality was seemingly triumphant, but then we have the pandemic and it's great irrationality. And uh, I just had to deal with it and, um, and its relevance to, to, uh, to McDonaldization. Um, so I've come to see a kind of ongoing struggle between the forces of formal rationality and science and its vaccines, especially the mRNA, mRNA vaccine, uh, state bureaucracies and the support for the science and vaccine, et cetera. Um, so on the one hand, you have that system. Uh, and remember, formal rationality is a, is a humanly created rationality and the seeming irrationality of the, of the virus and the pandemic. Um, so at the moment, at, uh, at the moment, we seem to be witnessing the triumph of formal rationality but the virus and its irrationalities continue to, to evolve. And so it's a constant uh, conflict between them. It, it really, uh, and Mike will talk more about this, it's really a conflict of rationalities. 
uh, the formal rationality of science versus the natural, you can call it that, natural rationality of the virus. Both um, and human, humanly created and, and natural uh, forms of rationality involve, are highly efficient. Uh, the virus is obviously highly efficient, predictable in terms of what will, what will, what will happen, uh, calculable in terms of uh, you can calculate um, the damage that it's doing and uh, in, in need of control. So um, that's a quick overview of the background on, on, on this topic and uh, how I got to uh, uh, COVID. Um, but I turn it over to Mike, who uh, is much more uh, involved and knowledgeable about that topic. Yeah, OK, so I, I'll just talk for a bit about how McDonaldization can be applied to the pandemic. Uh, then focusing specifically on how it can be applied to vaccine production and distribution. Uh, I think that's, that's, I'll talk about a bit where we need to be focusing our attention now if we're to, to relegate the pandemic to, to the dustbin of, of history. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but we can talk about that perhaps during discussion. I'm a little doubtful that it will, I have to say. Uh, and then I'll circle back at the end to, to what George was talking about, uh, about this conflict of rationalities. So I, I think we can start with a kind of baseline statement that what is efficient, predictable, calculable, and controllable at one point in time may not be at some other point in time. Uh, a pandemic is a classic black swan event, uh, which by definition doesn't have the characteristics of McDonaldization. Uh, black swan events are especially lacking in predictability and are difficult, if not really impossible to control. Uh, such events are also in many ways very surprising. So while another pandemic had long been anticipated, uh, and we're now, I think, already anticipating the next one, nobody knew exactly when it might occur or what kind of virus it might be or the impacts that it might have. Uh, and whatever it's caused, the, the 2019 pandemic, the COVID pandemic, has had powerful, wide-ranging effects. Uh, most McDonaldized systems, though, have proven unable to anticipate the next moves of the pandemic and to adapt continually to its ever-changing character. One reason may have been uh, that to those in power, it would have seemed inefficient to engage in all of the expensive preparations just in case there was a pandemic. An analogy to the major choices confronting society at the time is to be found in comparison between the old just-in-case system associated with US industry and the more modern just-in-time system pioneered uh, by the Japanese. In effect, much of the world, including the US, chose a just-in-time system to deal with potential pandemics. The plan, such as it was, and it was pretty weak, at least implicitly, uh, was that what would be needed if a pandemic were to occur would be produced and arrive just in time to deal with it. Largely rejected implicitly was the idea that at least most of the products, the drugs and equipment and masks and those sorts of things that would be needed uh, should have been stockpiled just in case they were required for a pandemic. Now there's some irony, and again, I, perhaps we can come back and discuss this more uh, in the discussion in the discussion section, but ironically now, since the development of vaccines, wealthy countries have turned to hoarding supplies just in case, right? So there's been this shift from just in time to, to just in case because now we know we need it, right? So we're gonna hang on to that. Uh, had no pandemic occurred, however, a just in case system would have been deemed irrational, wasteful, unnecessarily expensive, all of those issues. However, since the pandemic uh, is in full bloom, it, once it became in full bloom, it could still not yet be at the fullest bloom, it became clear that it would have been rational to have stockpiled much of what was needed. Uh, both just-in-case and just-in-time systems might have worked had McDonaldized systems been in place for either contingency, but in fact, no such system was in place uh, in either case. That said, operating efficiently has continued to matter during the pandemic. One example, given the increasing load of patients, especially in intensive care units, hospitals have had to operate even more efficiently than they had in the past. Efficiency was made even more important as hospital personnel themselves became ill and more work had to be done by fewer people. We've all no doubt seen the headlines of exhausted healthcare workers. Uh, in some states in the US, they were bringing in military personnel to assist with hospitals. It's been, I think triage would be a, a euphemism there. During the pandemic, people have also certainly come to live in a far less predictable world than they once lived in before. 
seeking to control the pandemic, society has sought, not surprisingly, to make this unpredictability more predictable. Uh, there are innumerable things that people did before um, that they quickly, suddenly we couldn't do, right? There were no more birthday parties, at least for people who were being socially responsible. Uh, there were no more graduations. Uh, for many people missed out on funerals, right, right key essential events. In some cases, these have been short-term changes for many people in many parts of the world were able to engage in these events again, but a lot of these changes are going to have long-term generational impacts. Uh, for example, the Malala Fund estimates that up to 20 million girls who dropped out of school or didn't attend school during the pandemic will not return, uh, a million of those in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. That's going to have a long-term generational impact. Uh, so I think discussions of moving past the pandemic or analyzing just what's happening in the moment are very short-sighted, right? We're gonna see ripple effects here. While the pandemic, uh, while the impact of the pandemic has been to greatly heighten the level of unpredictability for many people, much about the pandemic was in fact predictable, something like it had long been predicted by scientists. Uh, the range of impacts on individuals and society was predictable, something I'll come back to, as was sort of the general patterns of peaks and valleys of the disease. Uh, you know, epidemiologists have not been particularly surprised by how the disease is spread and the mechanisms and sort of the rates. That's why so many of their predictions have been close, right? not perfect, but, but within a range. The problem of predictability has been further exacerbated by the globalization and the outsourcing of the production of most of the things that we've needed during the pandemic, especially to places like China and India. And as a result, during the pandemic, the U.S. and many other countries have not been in control of their own destinies. Uh, the U.S., for example, became dependent on China at the same time that former President Trump was calling it the China virus and the Kung flu and all of these other highly offensive terms. And in fact, blaming China for the pandemic. It took quite a while for people to get past this idea that it was something created by a Chinese scientist in a lab. I'm not sure that everyone is past that, but scientists are, the evidence is. Uh, so the entire world also became dependent on India, uh, for example, for vaccine production. Uh, this led to production supply chain and what's most interesting to me, perhaps ethical issues when India began experiencing their own waves of the pandemic. And so a lot of COVID-19 vaccines have been produced in India and India has faced a shortage of COVID-19 vaccines. So there's a lot to be unpacked there. Calculability has also taken center stage uh, with reference, or certainly for the, the scientific community, the government, and the general public. Uh, that's been especially clear in media coverage and social media coverage. Uh, things, places like the CNN and the New York Times have these regularly updated numbers of how many cases are in, how, in what countries, and some instances that gets in the US, for example, you can get that data down to a county level. Uh, I, they update it about once a day and I somehow find ways to check it about three times a day just to see what's going on. So I've become obsessed with these numbers as I think a lot of people have. Um, those numbers are largely inaccurate, which is an inefficiency of calculability in this case. We know that the actual number of cases is significantly higher than the reported number of cases. I know those estimates vary quite a bit. A couple of weeks ago, the WHO released a report saying that they think that the actual death toll, for example, could be somewhere closer to 15 million. Uh, it's currently reported about 6.3 million. Uh, we certainly know that there's a huge gap between reported cases, confirmed cases, uh, and the actual number of cases. Again, I'm happy to unpack some of that during discussion. So these numbers have come to dominate our lives and dominate the media. Now, there have also been some subjective accounts. We've heard personal stories. There have been sort of human interest issues that have also taken headlines, but those haven't really garnered the same kind of attention as the numbers, right? We've all seen the charts and the graphs and, and calculability has taken center stage. There has also been a failure to control the pandemic adequately. At least initially, we needed time to develop and distribute non-human technologies. Uh, namely vaccines, with a result that we had to rely on human technologies, uh, such as physical distancing, closing down businesses and schools, keeping children home, using face masks, washing our hands, sort of more hygienic measures. Uh, 
in many instances, also the FDA has exercised too little control in the US. Uh, many tests for the virus are currently on the market, but only a handful have been FDA approved. So it's been left largely to the market to decide which tests are safe and useful and selling and successful. We've become in some ways more dependent on Amazon reviewers than we are on the FDA to figure out which test we want to buy. So the market has become uncontrolled and, and irrational. Uh, skip down here. So if, I, if, we, if we focus this discussion then on efforts to create a vaccine, uh, the concept of McDonaldization clearly doesn't just apply to COVID-19 itself, but also can be applied to our efforts to control it. I think this is perhaps key because while we need to understand the pandemic in and of itself, what I, I think is of the most urgency right now is figuring out how we can get past it. Uh, because despite discussions and rhetoric in the media that we are moving past it or discussions that we are going to just live with COVID, it's still raging out of control. The kinds of numbers that we're seeing are in, in December of 2020, we would have found outrageous, right? So I remember when my first, I've got six now edited books on COVID and when the first one came out, I included the timeline. And at the end of the timeline, it was remarkable because the US had just reached a seven day average of 10,000 cases. Right? And everyone was talking about how incredible that was and how the headlines that it made when the US reached 100,000 cases, right? And this was a big deal and schools were closed. I think the last time I checked, which was just a few hours ago, the US is about 107,000 cases and nobody really seems to care anymore, right? Globally, we're still averaging around half a million cases a day. Uh, it, we're still very, very much in the throes of this pandemic. Uh, and it's probably going to get worse as summer hits, uh, at least in the, the Northern Hemisphere. At any rate, McDonaldization applies perhaps far better to efforts to control the disease uh, than it does to the disease itself. The reason is the concepts of rationalization and McDonaldization were formulated with human constructs, bureaucracies and fast food restaurants in mind, and not for constructs associated with nature, such as disease in general and COVID in particular. So if we take the dimensions of McDonaldization and apply them to, to efforts to, can, to produce and distribute a vaccine, we can begin by thinking about calculability. It's clear that a vaccine was needed quickly. Historically, it's taken roughly five to 10 years to produce a vaccine. Uh, in the case of COVID, it was produced immediately. Actually, within two days of Moderna getting the DNA breakdown of the virus, they already had a vaccine in trial. That's completely unprecedented. The first vaccine uh, was the first vaccine to receive phase three approval, I should say, uh, was administered in December of 2020, just nine months after the WHO had declared a pandemic. This is all quite remarkable. Uh, the vaccine also needed to be and was and still is produced in massive quantities, uh, presumably to protect a, a, as large a portion of the global population as possible. So it's important to note that that portion has been highly unevenly distributed uh, and that there are other issues of calculability around we're not quite sure how many vaccines we're going to need or how long we're going to need them. Uh, there's still lots of questions there. Uh, there are lots of other calculable questions. How many doses are we going to need to have immunity? Uh, we thought two in the beginning. Along comes Omicron. Now we think three. Many countries, many countries are administering four. Some people are talking about making this an annual event. We still don't know. Uh, how much immunity do they give? There's lots of talk about the percentage of protection that different vaccines will give, how that percentage fades over time, uh, how long will it last? Uh, in some countries to get a booster, you need to wait three months, in others it's four, in some it's five, right? Numbers have, have become key here. Efficiency has also very clearly been center stage in vaccine creation. Uh, vaccine manufacturers clearly wanted to produce the largest number of vaccines in the fastest possible time, uh, perhaps to save lives, but most certainly to reap profits, and they have reaped a huge number of profits, and in order to do so, they wanted to get this done ahead of their competitors, right? It wouldn't be efficient to come out with a vaccine if, if everyone already has one, and we don't need it anymore. So producing the greatest number of vaccines with the least amount of costs has clearly been a priority. 
Efficiency was also clear and even accelerated in terms of vaccine testing and approval. So again, while most vaccines take years or more than a decade, testing and applications for COVID-19 vaccines have been fast-tracked. Uh, circling back to discussions of, of efficiency, that's been done arguably inefficiently at the expense of other vaccines and other review processes for other drugs which have since been delayed and, and sidelined. In many other ways, vaccine production and especially distribution has been very inefficient. Uh, many wealthy countries have hoarded vaccines, which is limited at worst or slowed at best their avail availability to reach people who still need them. Now, this is an extremely inefficient way to overcome a global pandemic. Right? If I only care about vaccinating my local population, and even if we think of it, that at a country level, people are going to be coming in and out of the country unless you live perhaps in North Korea or, or some highly isolated country. So just protecting myself isn't really a way to get past this. Uh, in fact, I've, I've argued elsewhere that perhaps the most selfish thing we could do is to vaccinate other people. Happy to, to circle back to that. Uh, as with other dimensions of McDonaldization, politics has been especially important here. So for example, while Russia's Sputnik V vaccine has been proven highly effective and was in fact the first vaccine in the world to receive approval at a national level, it's not yet been approved, seen approval from the WHO or many Western countries, uh, an inefficiency that is even more likely to not be corrected given the ongoing Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, a number of vaccines from Cuba, including Soberana and Soberana Lights, are likely to meet the same approval challenges for similar political reasons, uh, despite the fact that they're among some of the most efficient vaccines available. And Cuba's, of course, well known for their, their healthcare. Of greatest importance, perhaps, is the ability to predict that the vaccine will be effective and that it won't have too many adverse side effects. So given the extremely rigorous testing required of vaccines before they're given approval, or even emergency use authorization, most vaccines behave in highly predictable ways once they reach the mass market. That said, we've seen some surprises, uh, including with extremely rare reactions to vaccines, most notably the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, again, to circle back to issues of inefficiency, uh, I personally have found this outsized attention given to these extremely rare, literally one in a million cases, and the outsized attention they have got to be extremely inefficient in getting people vaccinated because it's created this scare for these extremely rare instances, these black swans within black swan events, uh, which has made people hesitant to then get any kind of a vaccine. Uh, one could also argue that many of the negative impacts of the pandemic have been highly predictable. Uh, research from around the world has shown that the most negative impacts uh, have been more heavily felt by minorities of all types, racial, ethnic, sexual, religious, goes on and on. Uh, and given long under long-standing understandings of inequality and the mechanisms that propel it, that outcome is probably be considered predictable to most. Uh, I've read quite a bit of social scientific research about the impact of the pandemic, and most of it didn't surprise me. Right? When you see the unequal impacts on, on women, when you see the unequal impacts on sexual minorities, when we see unequal distributions to Africa and to poorer countries, not surprising. Right? So a lot of that could arguably be predictable. Uh, if we think about control by non-human technologies, at base, any pandemic is a prime example of, of control by non-human technologies. Uh, viruses are not human. Whether or not they're even alive is a matter of great renewed debate. Uh, they're obviously not a technology, but they clearly have a profound ability to control our lives. Uh, in terms of vaccine production and distribution, our control over the virus, if we have it, has relied very heavily on non-human technologies. The proper functioning of machines and laboratories, for example, the various systems needed to transport and administer the vaccines, uh, the computers, smartphones, and other information technologies that have helped us track, report, and analyze viral distribution have all been essential to controlling the spread of the virus. And when these technologies have failed, our control over viral spread has also been impacted. So I'll now circle back to this discussion of the conflict of rationalities. Um, it, it could be argued that what we're witnessing in the case of COVID is a conflict, as George mentioned, between two very different forms of rationality. The blind, unconscious rationality of natural systems, like the virus, and the more clear-eyed, though often politically clouded, conscious rationality of a social system created by humans. 
Indeed, this is this kind of age-old conflict between natural and human systems. So while it's not created, well, it was not created by humans, I hope that that debate is settled, the virus has many of the characteristics associated with methionalization. Uh, for example, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, like all viruses, operates quite efficiently, including the way it evolves, it spreads, the way it infects. It's predictable in ways that, that we've talked about. Uh, it's calculable ways that we've talked about. Uh, we can try to control it through human technologies, such as vaccines, especially the mRNA vaccine, which is showing a lot of promise to help control other viruses as well. Moderna actually has already uh, in phase one trials a vaccine for HIV, so that's very promising. Um, but we've yet to mention the fifth characteristic of methionalization, the irrationality of rationality, or Georgia, but to, to really dig into it. In the case of humanly created systems, this is meant to indicate that as rational as those systems may be, they inevitably spawn a variety of irrationalities. However, in this context, it means that the rationality of the virus produces a range of irrationalities for human systems. Basically, it's rational for the virus to proliferate and evolve, but that constitutes a threat, perhaps in the extreme and existential threat to humanly created systems. For example, the virus may change so much that the ability of a given vaccine to deal with it may be reduced to such an extent that it's no longer effective. We've seen pretty clear signs of that as we've seen the benchmark for what it means to be fully vaccinated increasing. Uh, we've, so we've already witnessed that then with the Omicron variant, there's likely to be another variant coming. Um, so that's something to be played out. Without further advances in humanly created rational systems then, in this case, vaccines the, and the blind rationality of the virus to survive and even proliferate will have a chance to rage out of control and potentially threaten society as a whole. Uh, it sounds a bit like a sci-fi sequel to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. It, got, it took that idea from George, but it's a very real, uh, if remote possibility that the rationality of this virus or another one in the future will triumph over the rationality of humanly created systems. So even if that's a bit far-fetched, I'm not quite sure how far-fetched it is, it remains the case that we'll see the ebbs and flows associated with this continuing struggle long into the future. Uh, it's premature to declare the victory of humanly created social and scientific systems over natural systems. At best, this involves a perpetual conflict and a constant struggle by social and scientific communities to keep up with or try to get ahead of changes in natural systems, uh, as well as changes in our treatment of the natural environment, uh, and I would argue most adamantly in, in our systems of social inequality and how those are perpetuated and maintained. Uh, so with that, I will wrap it up and look forward to questions and a discussion. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, Maury has had to drop off and so uh, Bethany is going to be finishing up the hosting here and I'll pass it off to her. Um, so it looks like Richard has his hand up. If you uh, let me just say first, thank you so much, both of you. That was really interesting. And I learned a lot um, about things that I did not know much about. So it was really interesting. Thank you. Um, Richard, do you want to jump in? Uh, thank you. Yes, you alluded to uh, another set of dynamics, and that is political processes. And I wonder if that fits into your thinking at all. Political processes are somewhat rational if you take remaining in power uh the goal so you know what is rationality someone said depends on your point of view and your goal so uh as far as i'm concerned political dynamics interface with the two that you mentioned so i just wanted to ask your opinion as to whether that should be part of your thinking or if it's off the table i'll stop well i wouldn't put it off the table uh you know pol politics the political world is, is a, it's a rational system in itself and um, you know, it, it, it seeks to deal with various things, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. Um, I haven't really very, dealt very much with the politics of all of this. Maybe, maybe Mike has a thought on it. Yeah, I actually, you know, I, I, I get the argument that political processes are, are perhaps rational if it leads to remaining in power, right? That that is rational. I would say, though, that politics is often a gamble. So it can be sometimes unclear what you need to do to be able to remain in power. Uh, was it a safe bet that denying the virus 
and denouncing vaccines and not wearing masks and discouraging them was a guaranteed way to stay in power. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. It was a gamble. It was a gamble that unfortunately worked in many instances, uh, but I'm not sure that it was the best idea. Uh, it also could be seen, if, it is, if you do view it as rational, it would be an irrationality of rationality. Because when you're encouraging your constituents to not get vaccinated, to not wear masks, to not follow basic health procedures, they're going to get sick, right? Which could then turn them against you because you promised them they wouldn't, and they're going to die, right? So you're killing off your constituents because you're not keeping them healthy and alive. So it might have been viewed as rational by some because it was a nice little distracting shiny ball. Uh, for Republicans in the US, for example, it was able to set them in opposition to, to Democrats and I think uh, further their arguments about denouncing science in general, which is something they've been trending on, uh, denouncing education, denouncing rationality. Right? So this gave them a way to accelerate that. But in the end, uh, we know from the numbers that uh, infection rates are much higher in Republicans, as are death rates. Republican-led states have fared much more poorly. Uh, so if it's rational, I, I think it's an irrationality of rationality. Stay tuned for the voting patterns of Americans. <laughs> yeah, I'd, ra I'd rather not, actually. <laughs> yes. Denise, do you want to hop in? I'm captured by the distinction you made, Michael, between just in case and just in time. I think that's quite a, a profound observation because just in time solves a known problem. We know we're going to need this and it's gonna be ready in the queue when we do and we can you know, stimulate something to appear. So it's a known known kind of circumstance that that's the McDonaldization routinized uh, uh, approach to problem solving. Just in case anticipates unknowns. It is it's is, is it a known unknown or it's it's an unknown unknown. We don't know what's going to happen, but we got to get ready anyway because we don't know what's going to happen. In the old days of NASA, so we're talking a long time ago, probably 40 years uh, after man on the moon, but uh, before a lot of the more regularization of the shuttle system, they were practicing for disasters. You know, somebody would come up with an idea. Well, what if there was an air leak? What if there was a this? What if there was a that? And, and so on Earth, there was practice which was part of what helped them when, if you remember Apollo 13, when they had to improvise, I don't even can get the connection anymore. They had developed skills for solving unknowns with what they had. And so I wanted to ask you in your reflections and George as well, how do we build capacities, capacity in conventional organizations for thinking about the just in case situation, because there will be unknowns, as in the case of COVID, where we don't have a playbook and we have to figure out how to keep people safe. What insights might we have? And, I, and the idea, you got to do this in advance, can't do it at the time. Some capacity building, my thought. Well, the well, artist, just, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say actually, this, the idea came from George. Uh, so he gets credit here, but so I'll, George, you speak well, and then I'll follow the, I didn't invent it. It's in the literature on- uh, Take take the credit, it. George. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but the, the concept uh, comes from uh, Japanese industry um, and the American automobile industry was operating with a, a just in case uh, system. And so they had huge, um, inventories and yes. it was very costly to maintain those inventories and uh, and the Japanese came forward in the, in the auto industry and developed a, a just in case uh, just in time system so that the in a way the entire social system was organized so that the parts that were needed for an automobile were delivered just as they were needed to be put in the car and uh, that was a, so the whole society really was transformed into an efficient system to produce automobiles or other things 
And um, that would greatly reduce cost. You didn't have huge uh, inventory systems. Um, I worked in the automobile industry and, and when I was relatively young. And uh, there was just tons of stuff uh, around that in case they needed it. But um, that's a very expensive system to operate. And um, so uh, I think uh, more and more we've moved to a just-in-time system. But there are rationales with that, especially uh, you don't get there in time. Um, and that's much more catastrophic in the area of health than is in producing automobiles. Mike? Yeah, you know, I think maybe there's two kinds of just-in-case systems we can think about here. One is what might happen, right? And maybe that we don't know, but in certain instances, it's when it will happen. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the fact that there was another pandemic is it's, it's not surprising, right? There's going to be another one after this and probably another one after that, right? But so it, it wasn't so much a what as a when. Uh, in terms of building capacities, I think several things need to happen. One is politics need to change. We need to view this as something important. That means changes in resource allocation. So it can be inefficient if I have a stockpile of, of medicines and masks and ventilators sitting somewhere in a warehouse when I could have used those resources for something else that I need right now. Um, but we already do that with certain issues. This is what the whole basis of the military, especially the US military, right. has stockpiles of weapons that we absolutely don't, we could never use. We couldn't use all of our nuclear weapons because after a certain amount, we'd all be dead. Right? And the rest would just be sitting there. I mean, we have way more than we need to destroy the entire planet. That's really inefficient, but no one seems to complain about stockpiling weapons and tanks and guns and all these sorts of things. If you wanted to do the same thing with medications, you'd, you'd have problems, right? People would push back against this, it would become political. So I, I think to, and this circles back to the first question, I think it's about politics. It's about rethinking where we want to allocate our resources. Uh, it's about moving away from a system that focuses on profit to one that focuses on humanity. Right? Short-term profit isn't going to keep this species alive all that much longer if we keep this up. Right? We need to, to reframe uh, the way that, that we're thinking. Uh, no small challenge. So that's my answer. I, I dream that we stockpile experiences we can draw on when we need them. Yeah. Oh. You know, I've, <laughs> I've, I've said elsewhere that I think the best lesson we could take out of this is remembering. And that that's one thing that human beings are not very good at. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's one thing that has surprised me, it's just how quickly people have forgotten what the last two years have been like. Right? That they're going about life like nothing has changed and it has, or like it is what it was like in 2019 and it's not. Uh, and I, I find that very frightening. And I, I find that the reason why we're not going to move forward because we can't remember six months later. We're, we're like goldfish and, and we need to be elephants here. So we have about three minutes left. So Yana, uh, this probably will be the last question. Oh, sorry. Maybe there's if somebody else has also raised their hand. I can, okay. You, if you want. Okay, um, I think one thing I, I thought was very interesting, at least in Germany, for some time, some scientists put together this idea of a no COVID strategy. So the idea that you can really try to control it by having zero COVID. And that seems to resemble somewhat the um, political strategy of, of the Chinese government. So isn't so what I was wondering whilst listening to your talk, to what extent can you or are you looking at the, the various kinds of responses so the degrees you could argue of rationalization attempts towards something which cannot fully be controlled ultimately um, across governments so are you looking at that at all because clearly they are taking a very different strategy and i remember some time ago it was celebrated here as the way forward and look the chinese there they don't have to wear any masks and so forth and now suddenly it's completely the other way around where we are walking around relatively free and as far as we hear now here in the news that people um, are stuck at home. So have you looked at all at, at, at the kind of different reactions ac 
across governments, across countries? Mike? Yeah, uh, in fact, all of my work has been internationally focused. Uh, I've done some things that are case studies here and there, uh, but I don't really find that very useful uh, because it is a global pandemic. So I, I think it's difficult to look at any level other than the global. Uh, we can perhaps analyze specific policies that are instituted in certain countries, uh, but even then I, I think it's as your referencing needs to be done on a comparative analysis. Uh, one thing that's really interesting about Germany to me, and they, I think, were pretty successful in the beginning, and I, I actually don't think quite so much lately. Uh, in the last couple of months, we've seen huge spikes, so people are walking around without masks, uh, but they shouldn't be. They probably should be back in lockdowns. Uh, but, but what's interesting to me about Germany and, and the response there is it's led, it was led during most of the pandemic by scientists. And that doesn't happen, right? Merkel is a, a scientist. That doesn't happen very often in politics. So I, it's been really interesting, I think, to compare the backgrounds of different leaders across a number of dimensions, um, not just whether they're conservative or liberal or authoritarian or whatever labels we want to use, uh, but in terms of their own sort of intellectual thinking and what's being promoted. Um, I also just, I'm sorry, I was writing notes. I, talk about inefficiency. If you see me looking down, I still use a pen and paper, so very much in the 90s. You know, I think that the virus is something that we can control as well. So there's been talk, and I sometimes slip up and say it myself, that we can't control it. But I think with the right efforts, we, we can control it. We are absolutely capable of wiping this out. And the reason it has lasted as long as it has is because we have taken varying approaches that you're mentioning. Some people, if Germans are walking around without a mask, it really doesn't do much good for the French to have a mask on, right? Because the mask, and people seem to forget this a lot, is less about protecting yourself than it is about protecting other people. It, 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 it protects you, but not nearly as well as it's protecting other people, right? So it's, uh, it's not really a, a selfish act, it's more a selfless act. We could have wiped this out, had everyone acted in a more coordinated effort, had we enforced people to stay at home. I mean, the success in countries with low rates is that there was enforcement. They didn't have people waving assault rifles on the steps of Capitol buildings and kidnapping people and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and we also know historically that we can wipe diseases out. We've wiped a number of them out, right? So this could have easily, easily been one of them. Uh, but until we change our mentalities and our approach, uh, I'm afraid living with COVID is going to be unfortunately right. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but I hope so. Well, on that entirely uplifting note, yeah. we all when, wanna thank you, oh, please. I was, I was just gonna say, when you invite a bunch of sociologists to give a talk, <laughs> you gotta expect it's gonna be, it's gonna be a little depressing. The visible science. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you both so much for being here we we really appreciate it um we thank you very much um and hey okay, thank you <laughs>